week period coming up, take advantage. Our good friend uh, Chuck Fricky, uh, who's here with us this evening, initially approached our guests about coming to the Dole Institute. And our guest tonight will be interviewed by Professor Steve McAllister, the KU Law School. Steve was also instrumental, as was the Federalist Society and Professor Steve Ware, their advisor, in getting our guest here. And he's also a great friend of the Dole Institute. And some of you may not know this, but Steve uh, McAllister was also the interim director uh, right before I came on board and was uh, extraordinarily helpful to me and paving the way for me. And uh, he's been terrific to work with, and he does a lot of programs with us over here at the Dole Institute. John Yu is a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley. Mr. Yu immigrated to America from Korea with his parents. He graduated from Harvard with a BA in history and received his law degree at Yale. Mr. Yu clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas of the U.S. Supreme Court. He served as general counsel of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, working with Senator Warren Hatch from 1995 to 1996. He also got to know Senator Dole during that period. And from 2001 to 2003, he served as a deputy assistant attorney general in the office of the legal counsel at the U.S. Department of Justice, where he worked on issues involving foreign affairs, national security, and the separation of powers. He's authored a number of books, his last being Crisis and Command, the History of Executive Power from George Washington to George W. Bush. Please welcome to the Dole Institute and the University of Kansas, Professor John Yu. All right, well, I think the, the plan is John and I will talk a bit here, maybe 30, 40 minutes, and then we will open this up for audience questions. So be thinking of your questions. I think there'll be students with mics walking around at that point. But I thought we'd start with, uh, the, Phil just gave a, a brief bio for you, but maybe you could tell us a little about your, your background, your experiences, professional, educational, up to the point uh, you're in Washington on 9-11. We'll talk a fair amount about 9-11 and the events that follow, but sort of bring us up to 9-11 what you did, what your life was like, what your experiences were. Thanks. Before I start, I wanted to thank uh, all of you for inviting me to, to visit. And it's especially meaningful for me to visit the Dole Institute because, as uh, Bill said, I worked in the Senate uh, for the Senate Judiciary Committee when Senator Dole was a majority leader. And I remember uh, watching Senator Dole resign as majority leader so that he could pursue the uh, presidential nomination. And Senator Hatch was one of, uh, one of uh, Senator Dole's great uh, friends and supporters, at least when I was a staff member. And uh, I just uh, had nothing but admiration for Senator Dole. I think he represents a time in the Senate that we've lost, where uh, there was much more bipartisan cooperation uh, amongst members of the Senate. And I always just remember, um, uh, if you were a staff member on the floor or in the cloakroom and you were working on something, Senator Dole would always come up to you without knowing what you were uh, doing, but if he saw you were in an argument, he would put his um, arms around you and the person you're with and say, work it out. <laughs> that was he always said, work it out, or sometimes he'd say, get it done. And you would go off and do it. He had no idea what it was, but he wanted, uh, and it, but that was sort of uh, what he was about. He wanted you to make a deal in the end, that the, it was not an acceptable solution for the Senate to be paralyzed by uh, a refusal to bargain, that they had to have a compromise in the end. And uh, so I just always remember that about Senator Dole. It's also great to be here because uh, Chuck Fricke, uh, his invitation, his uh, brother Phil was one of my uh, great friends and colleagues, um, and he passed away way too young. But uh, Phil was someone, as a student, I read, it was one of the great pleasures in life to be a student, to read someone as a student, and then someday become a colleague of that person. And um, he would always tell wonderful stories about being an undergraduate here at Kansas and, and growing up in Kansas. And the stories about Kansas, I, sometimes I wouldn't believe them, so I'd have to come and see for myself. <laughs> so I have. And, um, and one thing he did not exaggerate was the love of people here for basketball, <laughs> which is something that we at California don't really have the greatest uh, <laughs> intensity over, at least college basketball, anymore. Um, and then. One last thing I just want to say is I want to thank uh, Steve for inviting me because Steve, uh, um, in addition to being law professor, solicitor general of the state, was, uh, one, of the was one of Justice Thomas's clerks the very first year he clerked on the court. Uh, I came several years after, and 
those of us who came after always always had the greatest uh, admiration and respect for those people who were there at the beginning. Um, so for uh, those of us in the Thomas Clerk world, he's part of what we think of as the greatest generation in uh, <laughs> clerks because he was there first. So it was a really great pleasure to come and spend some time with Steve. Uh, so um, in response to your question, uh, you know, I was uh, born in South Korea. Uh, my parents brought me here when I was three months old to the United States. So I say to people, I loved every minute I can remember of being in South Korea. Um, and we settled in the Philadelphia area. And um, one thing I always asked my parents when I got older, and not as a kid, and I said, uh, why in the hell did you pick Philadelphia? <laughs> because if you think about it, if you're an immigrant, and we're all children of immigrants, and this has probably come up at some point in all of your family histories, is you're not wedded to any particular place yet. Right? You can pick anywhere in the country to go. And so I always wondered why did we our family go to Philadelphia instead of Los Angeles or New York or Chicago where there were more Koreans. You know, one thing about being in Philadelphia was um, uh, always being one of the few uh, Asian families uh, in the schools we went to and so on. And uh, it was because, uh, or they told me in the 1950s when they were uh, coming of age, um, the Philadelphia Orchestra was considered the best orchestra in the United States. And that was the only thing they knew about the United States was the Philadelphia Orchestra. And so, in this kind of logic, you know, as you can tell, they're not lawyers, but this is the logic <laughs> <laughs> they employed. Well, the Philadelphia Orchestra is good. Everything else about Philadelphia must be good, too. <laughs> so that's, that's really why we chose Philadelphia, or they chose Philadelphia for us. So I uh, lived in Philadelphia, grew up there until went off to college. I went to college at um, Harvard and Yale because I didn't know any better and don't hold it against me that I went those places. Um, and then uh, clerk for Judge Silberman who was a Nixon administration, Reagan administration official who was a judge on the DC circuit who uh, taught me a lot more about the law I think than I learned at Yale Law School and uh, started my professorship at, at Cal at Berkeley and then clerk for Justice Thomas and then I was when I was clerking for Justice Thomas uh, the contract with America passed. I mean, the, the, 90, the 94 elections occurred. And I was so excited, and I studied politics, I thought I would go work uh, on the Hill. Um, and that's what led me to work for Senator Hatch. Um, and then I went, came back to teaching. And uh, before 9-11, my academic career really was about uh, war and war powers. So I sort of, um, as a young academic, I thought, uh, you may remember back in those days, people thought we weren't going to have war anymore, right? There were people writing books called The End of History. And war powers back in the mid, early and mid-90s was, was thought to be something of a constitutional law backwater. I, I thought it would be really interesting to study, but also part of the idea was you'd start writing in an area which wasn't overpopulated with scholars. So um, from 1993 to 2001, my academic work pretty much focused on um, two understudied subjects, war powers and then federalism, which was also not an in, in subject uh, in constitutional law at the time. Um, and I think I came to the attention of the Bush administration because um, during the uh, recount, I had done work on the role of federal courts reviewing the decisions of states. And that's what Bush versus Gore really was about. And so, uh, I uh, ended up being on uh, TV quite a bit because of the Florida recount. I um, wrote a bunch for the newspapers because I had been a newspaper reporter between college and law school, so I was writing some op-eds. Um, but I think my main gig, as it were, was uh, I, was, I became kind of a regular on what used to be called the big Neil Lehrer News Hour, and I would always be paired with um, Pam Carlin, a very liberal professor at Stanford. Um, about the meaning of the latest developments in Bush versus Gore, um, to the point where you know I recognized Pam's voice uh, faster than I could recognize my own wife's voice <laughs> during that time period, um, and then that's sort of what I think brought me to the attention of the Bush administration. Um, and so, um, before 9/11, back in the summer of 2001, I uh, came to work in the administration in what was a pretty quiet office, the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, and uh, the administration, if you remember, was going to be a domestic policy administration. It was going to cut taxes and reform education and not get into nation building, if you remember. 
And so the Justice Department doesn't have a lot of people who focus on national security and foreign affairs, but I happened to be one of them uh, at the time 9-11 happened. Okay, well, so tell us then a little bit, you told us how you, how you got there. So tell us about 9-11, being in Washington on that day and being in the Justice Department and then at least start down the path of the immediate aftermath, what, what the issues were, what things you were being asked to do. Well, you know, I, I still remember, you know, being in my office. Uh, it was at the Justice Department on uh, Constitution Avenue. It was a very uh, clear day, quiet day. Nothing much was supposed to happen in terms of the work of the government. And I remember the account of the first plane hitting and most people in the government thinking it had been an accident of some kind. Um, but when the second plane hit, which I saw actually happen on TV, because uh, you know, we all uh, went to watch the TVs in our suites, uh, everyone, I think the government immediately knew it was intentional, that it had to be terrorism, and uh, the view formed pretty quickly that it was Al-Qaeda, that they had a history of trying to uh, return to the same targets if they'd been unsuccessful, and as you remember, they tried to destroy the World Trade Center in 1993 with a uh, truck bomb. Uh, you may remember uh, the, there was an immediate uh, order issued to evacuate Washington, D.C., which I imagine probably has not happened since the War of 1812. Um, and this created uh, you know, the mother of all traffic jams where, I mean, in some ways the order was counterproductive. People had to abandon their cars and walk home because there was no way to actually move that many people out of Washington simultaneously. Uh, also. Uh, um, high government leaders were sent off to the various undisclosed locations, where, which everyone knows where they are if you're in Washington, uh, because they have signs on the fence outside the undisclosed locations that you're not allowed to know what's there. <laughs> it sort of it tips you off. Um, were sent off, but some people had to stay, and so I was one of the people who had to stay behind and start trying to figure out the legal dimensions of what our response was going to be. And the very first question we had to work on and that consumed our efforts from that first day was, was this really the start of a war? Could you have a war against an enemy that was not a state? And I think that that, to me, a lot of the controversy and divisions uh, in our society about how to think about the war on terrorism have a lot to do with where you come out on that first question. Um, well, for talking about the merits of that, I, I still remember a lot of the strange things uh, about that day. Um, Washington, D.C. being a ghost town, and so trying to walk around the city trying to find something to eat in Washington because all the restaurants were closed and uh, there was just nowhere to get a decent meal. And I think finding dinner out of the vending machines in the Justice Department, like popcorn and things like this. Um, and uh, because I'd never seen the city Em completely empty, like a, it was really like a ghost town in an old Western movie. Uh, no cars, no people, no sound. The city was qu utterly quiet. Um, at the same time, and the last thing I remember uh, that night was after spending all day and night there, was uh, driving home probably around 4 or 5 a.m. in what was then the morning of September 12th. And I lived in Virginia, and my route took me over uh, the Potomac River over a bridge. It went right by the Pentagon. And seeing the night lit up because the Pentagon was on fire. And that's, uh, that's an image I don't think I'll ever forget. Uh, and I thought I would never live to see was uh, the Pentagon, you know, in flames. Okay, well, so you, you've indicated or hinted at the first issue that you, you had to confront. Is this a war we're now engaged in? Can you talk a little bit about the major issues sort of that came up and then your role in addressing some of those issues? Right, so the fir first question was whether this was a war, whether it's possible to have a war against an enemy that doesn't have a territory, population, uh, armed forces, regular armed forces, cities, and so on. Uh, and then the second immediate, and we decided, I think, within that first day, not the first few hours, that it was a war, and that this was going to mark uh, a, a fundamental shift in how our country approached terrorism. Before 9-11, uh, I think parties, both parties, all administrations had considered terrorism to be a matter to be handled by law enforcement. So if you recall the bombing of the USS Cole in 2000 um, in Yemen, 
after the USS Cole's attack, we sent the FBI out and they secured what we thought of as a crime scene and they interviewed witnesses and we eventually did capture people and arrested them and brought them back to the United States for trial. This was not atypical. This was the way the United States traditionally approached terrorism. So I think that first decision marked a real sea change in the way we approached uh, the challenge of terrorism going forward. Um, the second question, the immediate question then, was um, the use of force. Could the United States respond to the 9-11 attacks by using force against al-Qaeda in Afghanistan? Um, what right did the president have to immediately respond, which in the end he did not do? And what power, uh, what authorization did the president need to get from Congress? That really was the first major set of issues. And our view was that um, consistent with the views of uh, presidents uh, going back quite a ways that um, President Bush did have the authority to launch an immediate response, an mil immediate military response, but in the end they chose not to uh, without the need for congressional approval, uh, but that we should get, uh, and that even though we didn't need congressional approval, um, the uh, president and advisors decided we should go get it anyway. And so uh, one of the first things I did right after 9-11 uh, was uh, work on the drafting of what became the authorization to use military force, which was passed on September 18th, um, which involved a lot of negotiation between the executive branch and the Senate and House leaders, even though in the end it passed, I think, with only one dissenting vote, vote, vote in the House, who, since I live in Berkeley, California, happened to be my congresswoman. <laughs> but other than that, passed unanimously in the Senate, and I think just one no vote in the House. But there was a lot of haggling back and forth uh, behind the scenes before it was introduced. Um, and so we spent a lot of time working on that. Um, and then the other, th the other main thing we worked on in part was a response to what had gone wrong. Because uh, what started to become clear was that um, you know, our intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies did have leads on several of the hijackers. And it turned out the CIA um, had known that two of the hijackers had photos of them and knew they were in the country. Um, but that there were these uh, <laughs> rules that had been agreed upon between uh, the Justice Department, law enforcement community, and the courts to uh, limit the ability to share information between our intelligence agencies and domestic law enforcement. And so one of the other first things I started working on almost immediately was um, do we need to change the laws to improve situations so that at the very least uh, we can recognize that terrorists are crossing our borders and that we shouldn't have any artificial barriers between what the foreign intelligence agencies do and what this, the domestic uh, law enforcement agencies do when they're tracking terrorists and trying to stop them from carrying out more attacks. That's a little, that's something that's less glamorous and people don't see, but um, uh, one of the, I think one of the most important changes that the Bush administration tried to introduce and I think the Obama administration has really continued has been trying to create uh, a sort of common pooling of all the information intelligence we have on terrorism so that when we do learn something, we can figure out how important it is and act quickly on it. And that's the lesson, I think, of the uh, successful operation uh, to kill Osama bin Laden was how pieces of information, some of the years apart, uh, were pulled together. It's almost uh, a way to describe it is sometimes it's like a camera lens that just comes into focus at some point. And I think that is sort of what you have with intelligence. You have lots of pieces of information that are out of focus. Something happens which pulls it into focus and then the thing that's amazing is that you, the military and the CIA are able to act in real time almost immediately once that happens to take advantage of it. Um, and that's something that I don't think really existed uh, in two th in, uh, at the time of the September 11th attacks. Okay. Well, tell us then, how do, how do you get to the issue of status of the people then captured on the battlefield? So the president gets the authorization, force is used, and we start capturing well, and the question is, are they prisoners of war? Or are they enemy combatants? What are they, and how are they to be treated? Yeah, so I, uh, as a, uh, you know, thinking back on it now over just over 10 years, the questions really start to come from the field as our troops start to get into Afghanistan in small numbers, in, in unconventional units, um, working with the Northern Alliance and achieving rapid, uh, unforeseen success. I mean, I don't think anyone thought we would be able to achieve what 
happened in those first early days of Afghanistan that quickly. Um, the, our forces start capturing people and the questions start coming in almost right away. What is, the, what is the legal status of the people we're capturing who are fighting on behalf of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? What are we, um, how are we supposed to house them? Uh, the one, and this is sort of immediate practical question is that under the Geneva Conventions, um, if you're an enemy prisoner of war under the treaty, uh, you have the right to be put in a barracks. Uh, and to maintain your uniforms and command structure and so on. You're, it's as if you were just a player who was being taken off the field. Um, not, you're not a criminal suspect. Um, you're not to be treated like you're uh, you know, a, a convicted criminal. Um, however, uh, a lot of the people that we were starting to pick up in Afghanistan were, uh, wanted to continue to try to kill people. And so one of the first questions was, can we put them in cell, individual cells? which is more like the way uh, criminal defendants are treated, but that that's sort of runs contrary to the idea behind the Geneva Conventions. And so that caused us um, at the Justice Department in um, late October, but really November, to sit down and think about this question of do the Geneva Conventions apply to our enemies in the war on terror? And our view was, and, and people of reasonable minds can differ obviously on these questions, uh, you know, our view was that Al-Qaeda um, is not a country. They didn't sign the Geneva Conventions. They refused to obey the Geneva Principles. And so we have no legal obligation to consider them enemy prisoners of war under Geneva. That leaves aside the hard question, which is, well, then what, what should the policy be if you're not legally forced to give them those standards? You could still follow them if you wanted to. And at that point, then, the ball kind of gets handed off to the defense and state departments for them to argue and figure out what policy should we use. But what I've always thought about that period is that we, uh, as a country, had a, a set of rules that we knew and understood and our military's trained for, we traditionally fought under, which is about how to fight another country that obeys the rules of war. What we had not encountered before was how would those rules work if we fought an enemy that uh, refused to distinguish themselves from civilians and deliberately targeted and attacked civilians, which runs counter to the basic principle of uh, rules of civilized warfare. And so when I look back on that, what I think we were doing, um, maybe sometimes consciously, sometimes not as consciously, was trying to adapt the rules that we had for fighting nations to this new kind of enemy and this new kind of circumstance, but which we had not done before as a country. Okay, so then can you talk a little bit about what you decided to do? I mean, they were designated enemy combatants. That led to decisions about where they're to be held. And of course, there's been a lot of reports about how they could be treated, whether you could try to interrogate them for information. I mean, talk about those issues a little bit. Yeah, well, so we, um, our view was that they had to be treated humanely, that this was a, a standard of customary practice and that this had been U.S. policy for a long time, even if they weren't to be considered um, Geneva Convention level prisoners. Uh, but that meant that in some aspects you could treat them more like criminal defendants, that you could uh, detain them in cells, for example, that they didn't have rights to lawyer and didn't have a right to go. Uh, so in some ways they're in between the uh, POW model and the rights that a criminal suspect would have in our domestic system, but they sit in between there. Um, and so the decision was made, we, well, we first we have to put them somewhere. And that uh, place became Guantanamo Bay after uh, the military and the State Department and intelligence agencies had a group that was looking for a place. And uh, Guantanamo Bay, as I said during dinner, um, Secretary Rumsfeld called it the best, least worst place that it was just by process, every other place was eliminated for various reasons and all that was left at the end was Guantanamo Bay. Um, it also happened to be the place where um, Haitian refugees that had tried to flee Haiti and get to Florida had been held by both the Bush and Clinton administrations back in 1992 and 93, so there was still a facility there, um, there was still legal precedent to hold them there. Um, when it came time to the interrogation issue, in a way that came up completely separately from 
the uh, Guantanamo Bay Detention Geneva Convention issue. So that all got resolved in January. And again, um, so one thing is worth emphasizing back at those times when we were just in the few first few months after 9-11 was that um, the, so the events that would come up would drive the legal questions rather than the other way around. That some of these questions we hadn't thought of before and would only be provoked by something that was occurring um, on the ground. And the, the thing that caused uh, the interrogation issue to come up was the capture of a fellow named Abu Zubaydah who was thought to be the number three or number four uh, leader in Al-Qaeda, one of Al-Qaeda's highest planners, and who was not going to cooperate with our intelligence agencies. And our intelligence agencies at the time knew very little about, uh, about Al-Qaeda, how it was working, what the future plans were. And it was thought that this fellow, if anyone in Al-Qaeda knew what the ongoing plots were going to be, it was this guy. And so uh, the CIA wanted to interrogate him in a much tougher fashion than would apply to a criminal suspect in our own courts. Um, what they wanted to do was basically uh, put uh, Zubaida through the same uh, run uh, that our officers and pilots and intelligence officers go through, um, something called uh, survival, I think survival, evasion, resistance, and escape training. Um, as a way just of trying to get him to cooperate, to, to weaken his just re utter refusal to uh, cooperate with his questions. And so the legal question that came to us in the Justice Department was, we have a criminal ban on torture in the country, but the statute that Congress wrote did not actually define what things constituted torture. We have a lot of people, I mean, people have a lot of ideas that, and, uh, about what is and is not uh, torture, but we not, may not all agree on them. And so uh, the job was for us in the Justice Department to try to sit down and to come up with what the line was uh, legally, about what that st statute prohibited and what it allowed, leaving it up to the policymakers, again, I think to make the much harder decision in my mind, which is then to figure out what are you going to do within the limits of the law. And of course, it's been an extremely controversial decision, and uh, of course, we knew at the time that it would be uh, a controversial decision, no matter what we did, no matter what line we drew. Um, I think we, you know, we tried to draw the best analysis we could given the materials we had at the time. We looked at a lot of different um, precedents from what uh, had happened in other democracies like England, Israel, Spain, Italy, to uh, what American practice had been, what the judges had said in decisions in federal courts, um, what the United States Senate and the people had said in Congress uh, when uh, the statute was, the criminal statute was passed. Um, then, uh, and this is sort of again where the sort of drop out of the story, I guess, the uh, CIA took that advice and developed a set of procedures that they thought was consistent with the statute and in our interpretation did not cross the line, but would be aggressive enough to get his cooperation. And in the next few months, uh, I think as a result of that intelligence, the United States then succeeded in capturing a whole bunch of other Al-Qaeda leaders too, like um, Ramzi bin al -Sheed. Uh, who was one of the plotters of the 9-11 attacks. And then uh, the most important person I think we've ever captured, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, just I think about a year later, who uh, was the actual guy who thought up of the 9-11 attacks and was still very much involved with uh, planning future attacks. Okay, well, can you tell us a little bit then, sort of looking back on it now with a little bit of a benefit of hindsight, it's still not that far behind us, but what would you characterize as the the successes of the Bush administration's efforts post 9-11 and, and also if you think there were failures or things that in hindsight maybe could have been done differently. Yeah, well, you know, certainly I, I'd be the first to admit that every government policy has a cost and a benefit. There's no um, easy, costless things to do. Um, if you can do those, you should have done them already. And so when you get to this point of decision, everything has a cost in addition to, and you have to, uh, I think the people who are elected to office have the harder job of figuring out when do the benefits outweigh the costs and when we should do them. So, uh, you know, for example, our interrogation policy or Guantanamo Bay have certainly cost us uh, diplomatically and politically in the world. Uh, the benefit is we got quite uh, important levels of intelligence um, 
I think at the, um, in 2009, the outgoing head of the CIA said something, something along the lines of two-thirds or three-quarters, I think, of all the intelligence we had on al-Qaeda in the first four years of the war came mostly from those interrogations. We just did not know much about um, al-Qaeda. Um, the benefit has been, I think, that uh, that intelligence has led the uh, administration of both parties to be able to stop terrorist attacks and that we have not had another successful attack 10 years later. Um, back when we were in the government uh, in the first few months after September 11th, people in the government who worked on terrorism, people outside the government who are experts on terrorism, all expected there to be, uh, in the very near future, another successful attack because our country, we have an open society. It's very easy to come into the country, and it's very easy to move uh, money and people around in the country. It's very easy to buy things which are weapons or can be made into weapons. And uh, one thing that we were really worried about was what eventually happened in India and Bombay, where um, a trained team of people with small arms um, basically went through a city and killed a large number of people. And we were extremely worried that al-Qaeda was going to try something like that rather than uh, hijacking planes and trying to crash into the buildings, which they have continued to try to do. Um, so, well, <laughs> I, uh, I don't personally know in the end who was responsible or not for the anthrax attacks, but, um, well, and I... <laughs> I, I'm not so sure about that myself, and I, I... Did it terrorize the Congress to shut it down? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Government, government continued, but let's, we'll, we'll get to audience questions here in a few minutes. Um, so, in talking about successes and challenges, I also wanted to have you talk a little bit about continuation or change between the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And, your perspective on to what extent has the Obama administration continued policies the Bush administration adopted, perhaps extended them or cut back on some? Well, I think um, there's been a lot more continuity in the actual policies than uh, people would like to admit, I think. Um, certainly the Obama administration did campaign on a platform of reversing a lot of the policies. and. Uh, you know, the most, signature one, the most signature ones were closing Guantanamo Bay within the first year and transferring a lot of the criminal, a lot of the, sorry, the people held in military detention there to prosecution in civilian courts, particularly in New York City. And uh, in the end, the administration, this is the current administration, pulled back from both of those, uh, both of those uh, platform, uh, policy platforms. I personally think that uh, I'm personally glad that they didn't live up to their campaign, uh, campaign promises because I think once they came into office, I think they saw uh, the intelligence that had worried uh, the Bush administration so much. And so I thought, I think they made the decision that uh, they had to maintain some of those policies because the security threat was in fact higher than they had thought it was. Um, I also think this is an example where Congress has actually been more aggressive on terrorism than the executive branch. And so one thing that struck me uh, having, uh, when I was in the government and then watching afterwards, is that uh, I thought the claims that the president and the Congress were struggling over uh, power was uh, more exaggerated than it actually was. That um, by nature, the presidency had to respond immediately to the emergency and crisis created by the September 11th attacks. It is the branch of the government created by the Constitution to respond to crises and emergency. Um, Congress, in those first few months, I think years after 9-11, really does, did not want to oppose those policies. I think they, in some ways, they're more than happy for the presidency to go first and to take all the accountability and responsibility for those policies. And if there's a mistake, it's the president's fault. Congress, I think, has a lot of tools at its disposal to stop and counter uh, presidential policies. It helped, obviously, that the Republicans uh, were in charge of the presidency for the first eight years, and then the Congress from 02 to 06, so um, there was party agreement as well. But I don't think you had a situation where the Congress wanted to actually um, seriously cut back on the things that the executive branch had done. In fact, this question we started with, the Geneva Convention issue, and what's the status 
of Al Qaeda members who were captured. Eventually, Congress did pass an act, the Military Commissions Act, which actually found that, uh, yes, in fact, Al Qaeda members are illegal combatants who are not prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions. So even when the Congress got into, act, into the act, they ended up taking a fairly aggressive posture that was in agreement with the executive branch. It's only been in the last two, three years where the Congress and the President have disagreed, but they've disagreed with the effect that Congress has been the more aggressive branch on terrorism than the President has. So uh, it's Congress that's keeping Guantanamo Bay open. It's Congress that's preventing the transfer of anyone out of Guantanamo Bay to the United States for trial or the release of anyone from Guantanamo Bay to another country, primarily through the funding power. Uh, I think that's perfectly constitutional exercise of the power of the purse as it would have been if uh, Congress had done that under President uh, Bush. But I think that uh, because of that, the end result has been a lot of continuity. I don't know, I can't say whether um, the Obama administration would want to have been uh, <laughs> continuous throughout. The, and the one area where the Obama administration has gone way beyond what the Bush administration has done has been obviously in the use of drones. Um, to engage in a campaign of targeted killing, which I think now is five or six times higher than it was during the comparable period in the Bush administration. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying that the, the Bush administration, as far as I know, had any particular reluctance to use drones. It's just that drones as a technology did not start to become really available the way it has now until towards the end of the administration. Um, but I think it also reflects a difference in strategy. I think the Obama, Obama administration, in fact, um, is more, uh, has put more emphasis on trying to kill al-Qaeda leaders, whereas the Bush administration really wanted to capture them. And um, I think that has its pluses and minuses, too. It may lead to more public uh, victories, as it were, when we, we all feel a great deal of satisfaction, I think, when the country finally does get Osama bin Laden. I, however, think uh, from an intelligence perspective, we should have captured him instead, that that would have been much better for us than actually killing him outright. Okay, well, let me shift gears for a little bit before we uh, open to questions. You, you have a lot to say and you've written a lot. In fact, your most recent book is actually about globalization and its effect on America and America's role in the world and its effect on our laws. And I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about, I think you've raised objections to some treaties, perhaps the Chemical Weapons Convention. You, you were in a recent op-ed with John Bolton, who's going to be here to do a, a Vickers lecture in a couple of weeks, talking about outer space and how it will be regulated. And maybe just tell us a little bit about your views on going forward, America's role, and why you may have some concerns about international treaties and organizations. Well, I, I think one thing that's happened in our world um, that is irreversible and nothing that the United States can control is globalization. The, the rapid movement of uh, products, goods, services, money, people, capital, all across state borders, um, where about a quarter of the American economy is dependent on international trade, where um, how uh, the Greeks work out their debt problems has an immediate and significant impact on our stock market and uh, the, how much it costs to borrow money and the ability to engage in a good recovery here in the United States. Um, globalization um, has led to an urge to engage in a level of international cooperation we haven't seen before because uh, globalization makes it harder for any one nation to control any problem. Uh, anymore. You need to have a certain level of cooperation to deal with pollution, global warming, crime, terrorism, and so on. Um, so global, because that's globalization has costs as well as benefits uh, for the United States as other as it does other countries. Uh, but I think what's happening that is new is that um, we are starting now to have uh, treaties that have to have a certain global scope uh, and a level of re detailed regulation domestically that didn't exist before. So if, take for example. Uh, a treaty to ban certain kinds of chemicals, or a treaty that would um, try to control global warming. Those kind of treaties would require uh, either bans on chemicals that are, are used by you know, civilians inside the United States, or limits on the amount of energy and pollution that can be used by cars and trucks and, and home heating and so on to be effective. So one thing about treaties, I think, is that they are no longer um, you know, alliances or deals between nations, that they're more like regulations that uh, legislatures used to, uh, or, or still do, uh, implement. 
The second thing I think that's a big change has been uh, the creation of new forms of international organizations. That's also something quite new because uh, in order to administer these new kinds of treaties uh, in a neutral and partial fashion, you need to create uh, new forms of international bodies. Uh, the problem for our constitutional system, I'm not saying that the United States can't participate in them, but they have to do it in the right, we have to do it in the right way that's consistent with our constitution. And the problem is the same ones that arose during the New Deal is that these kinds of agreements call for a level of government power that's quite broad, but also delegates that power to institutions that are less accountable in the democratic process. Um, this was really brought to a fore in a Supreme Court case called Medellin versus Texas, where uh, the International Court of Justice ordered the first the United States, then the Supreme Court, and then the state of Texas uh, not to carry out a death sentence on a capital defendant who had committed pretty gruesome murder but had not received their warnings under a certain treaty because they were, they, he was an alien, um, which the United States admitted. We admitted that we had uh, violated the treaty in his case. Um, and you can see there that's a, that's a sort of a kind of tension between our, con and eventually the Supreme Court chose our constitutional system and said the orders of an international court in that treaty do not uh, change the way our domestic legal system works. But that kind of tension between our domestic constitutional system and the demands of uh, international cooperation, I think, are just going to become more and more common because globalization is sort of seeping into our economy at such a fast rate. And so, our, so the solution we propose in this book is that we should, to the extent possible, still try to maintain the same democratic processes we use to make decisions domestically when we cooperate. So that if, uh, if we violate a treaty and, and some international court tells us that we have to stop an execution or that we have to change some policy, it still should be up to Congress, that whom we elect, to pass the law that carries it out or it's still up to the president who interprets international law and conducts diplomatic relations for the country to decide what has to be done to come into compliance. But that the United States constitutional system doesn't um, admit the delegation of power outside our system entirely uh, to a body that is not part of our government. So one, one final question, I have to ask the audience to be ready if you have questions and if we have mic holders that they would be ready as well. So I'm curious, what about outer space? What's the, the <laughs> that was just two weeks ago in the, in the New York Times, what's the objection or the concern about possibly signing on to, as I understand it, some European code of conduct about how things work in outer other, space? Other than I always wanted to be a space cadet <laughs> and wanted to write about space someday, <laughs> was that, um, so one thing that's been happening, in our, and this has been done by uh, presidents of both parties uh, for a number of decades, is that the, one of the things that framers put in our Constitution to make sure that our international obligations did receive a certain test of uh, consensus was the, the, the treaty power of the Senate, which requires a two-thirds majority, uh, one of the highest vote requirements that the Constitution sets out. Um, presidents, uh, what they've been doing um, has been because they don't want to submit certain kinds of international agreements to the Senate as a treaty have been instead saying, we're just going to follow the European Treaty on Outer Space, or we're going to follow something called the Law of the Sea Treaty, for example, or we're going to follow um, uh, an additional protocol to the laws of war without submitting the agreement to the Senate for its up or down vote. And Normally, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, you know, the executive branch can't choose a policy to follow in foreign affairs. The problem is that under international law, if the United States and a number of other countries follow something like that for a number of years, it eventually becomes uh, in binding international law. And so you have the possibility that uh, the United States could be bound to certain kinds of regimes, like something to govern um, the use of satellites in outer space. Uh, in a way that never undergoes any kind of approval process uh, in the country. And so outer space happens to be uh, an area where uh, efforts to engage in arms control are really starting now. Um, this is an area where the United States has a huge lead. Uh, obviously, uh, other countries like uh, China are trying to catch up. But uh, one thing we thought is that if we are going to reach some kind of deal on regulating uh, 
uh, an arms race in space, it should be something that's negotiated openly and presented to the Senate for its up and down vote, just like uh, missile reduction treaties, anti-ballistic missile regimes, and so on. But that what shouldn't happen is that somehow the United States sort of become bound by it without there ever being that kind of uh, approval that the Constitution sets out. So that's what uh, uh, John Bolton and I were uh, worried about, and we might be writing about it slightly prematurely in that um, you know, the United States could still decide not uh, to go along with the outer space regime in the end, but that we wanted to raise the warning flag that uh, this was happening now so that people could think about it and uh, decide whether this really is a course that we want to pursue in this uh, strange way that doesn't go through the treaty process or through Congress as a statute. Okay. Well, I think at this point we'll open it up if there are questions from the audience. I think we've got one or two folks with mics available here. And of course, the, just a quick reminder, the Dole Institute policy is, of course, to ask a question. Uh, no speeches, but My please first. ask your questions. Professor, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. I have not read any of your writings. I'm looking forward to uh, getting one of your books and doing that. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, were uh, following some of these uh, international rules and regulations. Uh, one is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Agenda 21 from the UN, uh, where a lot of those policies have actually been impregnated into our, through executive orders from the president, and George H.W. Bush did it, and then Clinton, uh, and then George W., and now Obama. Uh, what, how, do, how do we stop that kind of thing from happening? Uh, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're referring to, uh, my memory of this is that this is about um, uh, limits on development and uh, growth of cities, um, populations. That's, that's yes, yeah. and, uh, Property rights, basically, is the yeah, right. So uh, this is actually a great example of the problem I'm talking about, which is uh, the other dimension of the issue is not just that we're entering into more agreements because of globalization, but that because globalization is becoming so commonplace that things that are traditionally in the power of our state and local governments are now something that become matters of international diplomacy, like uh, questions about zoning and where people get to build apartment buildings and mass transit and so on um, are suddenly a matter of international concern uh, in a way they were not 50 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, and so to me, uh, putting aside the policy of whether uh, whatever limits or standards are chosen by the United Nations on this question are the right answer, it still seems to me that it has to be implemented in some democratic process under our constitutional system. That um, a judge, for example, or a town can't just say, we are compelled to place limits, say, on the growth of the city in this direction because that's what the UN requires. Uh, so in my mind, it's, uh, it's still a policy decision that has to be made through the same democratic process we would use to make that decision independent of uh, the UN declaration. And so I know um, some states like California, there are more cities that are doing this, I think, than other places. And there, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people concerned about it. Um, and in the end, maybe the, they're, you know, maybe the UN standards are the right ones, but they ought to undergo a, t a democratic test. And so the, country, the, the one example I point to where this didn't happen was Europe and the European Union. In the European Union, um, there are, their system is actually criticized by Europeans themselves for having a democracy deficit because a number of decisions are made by the European Union governing bodies. They never undergo any kind of democratic uh, approval process. Um, and in fact, one, when things like the European Constitution actually go up for a referendum, they actually have a lot of trouble because uh, the voters aren't necessarily happy with the direction that things are going in. Um, the other thing, I think is that this actually should lead to better, more stable international relations on the part of the United States. Sometimes it's easy to sign off on treaties and declarations and so on if you don't expect the United States to have to implement them. If we sign on to agreements and we have to put them through a vote in Congress or they have to be adopted at the state and local level through, uh, through the normal voting procedures, then, you're really, then the United States really is committed to following through on that international agreement. Um, 
right now, I think we actually live in this world where a lot of other countries are unhappy with our performance of international law, but because of the way we're entering into them without a democratic uh, approval method, uh, people are not committed to following, following those objectives. So I, I would think, hopefully, um, before any town or county or state actually were to impose these kinds of restrictions, that they have to get a vote in the legislature just like they would for any other kind of uh, any other kind of measure involving land use or property. We can take up the uh, question of whether it was a fact that the anthrax attacks that uh, apparently targeted two sitting U.S. senators who were about to decide on the Patriot Act uh, was in fact a terrorist act, being that it came from the bowels of the U.S. weapons uh, establishment. But well, my just, question is, can I just I just want to answer your question about that because I I was actually more focused on your point that this terrorized the government and it paralyzed it. As I, I had, um, you know, my secretary actually opened one of these or was worried it was thought she might have opened one of these anthrax letters and had to undergo a regime of uh, antibiotics and so on. Um, my only point was I don't think that the Congress shut down that the government was terrorized to a level where it couldn't function. I mean, actually, I think that. Um, people, in many cases, quite bravely went on with their work in the government from the secretaries who opened the mail to some of the people who received it, um, despite the idea. I, you know, at the time, I, I didn't think that it had been a foreign terrorist attack. Um, and I know there's been a lot of uh, investigation about whether this particular scientist at one of the weapons labs had done it. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he had committed suicide before um, the investigation had closed out. Um, and if that's true, it's a case of domestic terrorism that's unconnected to uh, al-Qaeda. But I don't, I, I just remember at the time that this did not bear the hallmarks of al-Qaeda's uh, modus operandi. And I, re I just remember thinking at the time that this was not really something that we could attribute to them. But yeah. The, the, the handwritten note that was delivered with one of those anthrax letters was death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. So apparently someone was trying to make it seem yes. that yeah, uh, Islamic that. jihadists were attacking U.S. senators uh, I, before I the Patriot I, You're Act right on that. I agree on that. I, ju I just don't, I didn't think it was real. Oh, okay. uh, and a lot oh, of the, so you knew uh, it was a, a, fake, a fake attack then? No, no, it was, I, it's just, I, I have to say I was not involved with the, you know, the evaluation of that threat and the response. I just remember being in the government, having people uh, under my... Uh, you know, management who had to actually worry about this, and some of whom might have been subjected to the virus. Um, I just remember thinking this was most likely a homegrown terrorist attack, just because Al Qaeda does not has not operated in that way before, um, and it just didn't. I mean, if they had weaponized anthrax and it was Al Qaeda, they would have done something much worse with it, I think, than sending it in letters to Congress. But, but go ahead. Mm -hmm core of what I believe that we're talking about here, which has to do with the powers of war mm -hmm. deemed to elements of the executive branch by the U.S. Constitution under the powers of the American people. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, do you believe that it is lawful for an American president or any other elements of the executive branch to wage or stage war against the American people or the U.S. government, mm -hmm. specifically defined under Article 3, Section 3 as treason. And just two examples to sort of point out what I'm talking about is during the Kennedy administration, uh, elements of the Joint Chiefs of Staff proposed Operation Northwoods, which was doing domestic terrorism, uh, assassinating Amer American people and blaming it on Cuban uh, elements in order to mm -hmm. uh, get that going. Uh, another uh, ele uh, some event that speaks in that direction would, would be um, 93 World Trade Center bombing. The, one of the uh, agents involved in that bombing was supplied the bomb making material by the FBI and it was apparently allowed to go forth. And then of course there's tons of evidence out there that shows that September 11th was uh, staged similarly, including 
tons well, of but terror you, drills. Do you have a question for him here? Yeah. I mean, is, this is what we try to avoid, I mean, the, maybe afterwards, yeah. but okay. do you have a question you'd like him is, to answer? Is it, is it lawful in your understanding of the U.S. Constitution for an American executive to stage a uh, war or wage war against the U.S. government or the American people for the greater good or because they think it's necessary no, I, for I geopolitical aims? I mean, I think there's an easy answer to that legally, which is obviously that would be unconstitutional and a president who did that would be impeached. I, I have to confess I do disagree with you on the factual assumption that you're making that the 9-11 attacks were staged by the United States government. I know that there are some people who think this and they think this with a lot of fervor. Um, uh, right. I, I do not personally believe that that is the case. I do believe that the 9-11 attacks were carried out by a foreign opponent without the involvement of the United States government. Um, I think that it was uh, an attack carried out, planned, and executed by a very capable enemy. And I know, I realize some people th in some part think that an enemy can't be that capable, so it had to be the government. I actually have nothing, unfortunately, but respect for the capabilities of Al-Qaeda. Um, I think if you look at their backgrounds and what they've done in the past, you are dealing with a lot of highly educated, motiv uh, ideologically motivated people. And uh, uh, you know, I'm, what I was worried about at the time and uh, still am worried about, but not as much so as I was in the government, uh, was that they were going to be able to carry off more attacks on the United States, that it wasn't uh, just a stroke of luck that they succeeded on 9-11 because we are dealing with some very resourceful, intelligent opponents. Um, and so we should never, at least I, I don't think we should ever uh, make the mistaken assumption that we are not dealing with people who are uh, very dangerous and resourceful and intelligent, even though I believe that they are acting for utterly the wrong reasons. Thanks for it. Hello. Um, as far as the Geneva Convention is concerned and uh, filling in the gray area and interpreting uh, that, to what extent do we need to be international when interpreting it, filling in the gray area? And where do we draw the line as far as cooperating with other nations so that we don't interfere with our own sovereignty to act as a nation? So it's a good question. It's a hard, I mean, it's a hard question to give you a, a rule that would apply in every situation. I, I can tell you, what, uh, you know, how we thought about the Geneva Convention issue, which very much fits into your question, which is that, uh, at least from our perspective at that point, in the first few months after 9-11, was that we didn't think the Geneva Convention was a rule book that could be pulled off the shelf and applied to a war against a stateless enemy. And so what we had to do was figure out what kind of rules were going to apply. And you're perfectly right in your question to suggest that there is going to be a lot of uh, discussion, disagreement, uh, demand for consensus about what those new rules should be like. Um, one thing, however, uh, is that we were the ones who were attacked. And the United States, for good or ill, has the largest military in the world that conducts more wars and is involved in more fighting than most everyone else. And so I at least think the United States should have a primary say in the kinds of rules that are going to apply, um, just because it is the one with the, we're the ones with the responsibility um, to try to maintain some kind of international uh, peace and order in the world. Um, however, if you were to do it just on a sort of a consensus basis, most of the countries in the world don't have the kind of armed forces and global responsibilities that we do. And so one thing that worries me is that if we uh, give, uh, give too much value to universal agreement on the rules that should pertain to fighting terrorists or any, you know, any other new kind of new war issue, um, that you don't want to give, I think, a veto, as it were, to countries that aren't involved anymore. That uh, um, you know, there might be a lot of them by numbers, but if they don't have any kind of uh, real assets at stake, if they're not themselves conducting military operations, then they may not really understand the consequences of some of the choices. Um, and so I think that, that tension between wanting to have cooperation but not giving a veto to countries that are not really fighting wars anymore is, is persistent. On all, you can see on all these issues that it recurs over and over again. 
Um, and so I can't tell you every time we, what the United States ought to do, but on the Geneva Convention issue, I felt quite strongly that we were trying to develop rules, and eventually maybe there will be an agreement. Uh, there will be some kind of written down treaty that's going to be signed by various countries. But it particularly seemed to me right at the beginning, when you're figuring out what works and doesn't work and what to do, that would be the last time you would fix in stone what the rules would be. So I, I'm, I'm sorry about the, I mean, it's sort of a excessively, I think, lawyerly way of thinking about it probably, which is sort of like a common law, this is what a common law lawyer would do, is sort of say, well, let's give some time for development and evolution and try things out before you actually set down uh, the rule. But I think that's what you see when it comes to warfare and its regulation, that a lot of time the rules are developed after the wars are over because it's only at that point that you can look back and see what were the decisions and the consequences of those decisions. Uh, the military, or military authorization bill this year gives permission uh, to the military to detain American citizens associated with terrorism. Mm -hmm. Are you worried that, you know, it might be abused in the future? Or, you know, so you're talking your about the, um, I believe, the provision of the National Defense uh, Authorization Act, which, yeah. uh, where Congress actually, this is what it actually was an example of where Congress was trying to get, was trying to be more aggressive than the executive branch wanted to be on terrorism because the provision, I think, that you're referring to uh, was, uh, was stating that uh, the civilian law enforcement system was not to be used for the detention and trial of people who are connected with al-Qaeda. What Congress was trying to do was to force the Obama administration to use military commissions and military courts for um, anyone who was captured, who was engaged with an al-Qaeda operation or so on. And I think, so as a constitutional matter when it came to aliens who are members of al-Qaeda, I don't think this was, this raised constitutional problems. The constitutional problems would, agree, would raise if they were American citizens, and I think that's what all the attention was. Now, uh, you know, I, um, I would think, my, my personal bias would be that I would think that the executive branch should have the choice rather than Congress trying to restrict it to one specific way. If Congress wanted to use its funding powers that way, though it could. I mean, I think constitutionally Congress could say no money is to be spent uh, by the FBI or you know, by a federal court to try uh, an al-Qaeda member, effectively preventing the president from using law enforcement. But if, I th I think if you know, Congress put a, a waiver in the statute, recognizing, I think, that presidents should have this discretion to choose uh, and then allowing, and then I think, I believe President Obama triggered that waiver and said, you know, if he makes a finding it's important for the national security interests of the country that he can continue to use law enforcement. Um, so uh, I guess at one level, um, I would be wary if it were a blanket rule. On the other hand, I actually thought that the political process worked, right? that you had a level of fighting and negotiation between the president and Congress using their constitutional powers that led, I think, actually to a pretty good outcome, which is that the president still retained that discretion, but Congress made its policy wishes known as well. Um, what I would worry about, what I wouldn't want to happen, uh, for example, is for the courts to suddenly have a decision where they decide, uh, you know, the presidents can never use that or they can or must always use this military detention system that it should be something that the president and Congress should negotiate and reach a decision on. Um, I will say um, the idea that the military should not operate inside the country um, is something that's been with us since the end of Reconstruction, uh, you know, which is why you don't see troops in the United States except for uh, national emergencies or disaster relief. Um, but Congress has an exception in that ban. This is called the Posse Comitatus Act for situations of war. Um, so sometimes I, I, I see what I think of as incredible claims that uh, the military cannot operate at all in the country, even if, as we saw on 9-11, we had to think about this on 9-11 because we had reports of civilian airliners still in the air heading to Washington, and the Air Force wanted to know whether they could shoot them down if they had to. And that's the use of military force inside the country on civilians. 
Uh, now, the, the, the reason for it is not to kill a civilian. It is to stop a military attack. And unfortunately, some civilian lives uh, would be lost uh, to bring down one of those bearing lines. And thankfully, we didn't have to do it in the end. But I think, you know, I think that shows you that there has to be some space for uh, military operations that are in defense of the country from an attack, especially if it occurs on our own territory. I mean, one thing that 9-11 attacks always uh, had revealed to me was how lightly defended the actual territory of our country was on September 11th. If you go back and look how few fighter jets are actually on station back then and in the country as a whole to defend it. It's, um, it's, uh, once you get into the country, the, we really are very vulnerable. Um, and September 11th kind of showed the military is really aimed and designed to fight wars in other people's countries so that they don't fight wars in our territory. But if you make it through as terrorists can, then uh, we really have, I mean, uh, then I think we have very limited assets to protect, to protect the country from armed attack. <clears throat> the, um, when, when Robert Woodward was here some time ago, one of his primary concerns had to do with intrusion and secrecy in our society as we move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Timothy Shorrock, in his book, Spies for Hire, did a really fine job of outlining the collection of data, mm -hmm. tele telephonic data, electronic data in general. And I think the current Wired magazine has a rather interesting article that, if one believes Shorrock's positions, is entirely realistic as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've thought long and hard about some of these issues. Have you thought much about the issues of secrecy, intrusion, et cetera, and how we begin to get at that um, when, when it seems to be that many of the things we're doing and talking about are elaborating and making that easier and more, uh, more um, pervasive? Um, so I have to say I haven't read all the things you mentioned. Um, I'm uh, particularly not cool enough to read Wired magazine on a consistent basis. Current, <laughs> Current issue, too. Um, uh, I have read some of uh, most of Bob Woodward's books about uh, the the wars and actually before the wars. Um, and I mean, you put your finger on one of the great dilemmas of this kind of war. More so, I think, than past wars is how how much secrecy does play in this kind of conflict. Um, for good and ill, and it's a hard balance, I think, to strike. And I'm not here to say that the that the United States or the Bush administration or the Obama administration has struck the right balance every time, but the um, but there has to be some kind of balance because um, we are fighting an enemy that disguises itself and doesn't fight out in the open, and right we. You know, once a terrorist attack occurs, then you have a lot of intelligence on the people who are responsible, uh, but then it's too late. So the way to think about it is um, the main difference to me about the way the intelligence agencies work and the way in the military and the way criminal, defense, criminal the law enforcement works is that in criminal law enforcement, a crime has already occurred, or we think a crime has already occurred. Uh, in some way, our society has uh, decided we're going to allow it to occur. You know, we, we don't live. You know, we don't live in the world of the Minority Report movie, where we know who's going to commit a crime first and we stop them. Uh, what our legal system does is we we put together after the crime who's responsible, and then we hold them accountable. But the crime occurs first. Uh, the intelligence and the military agencies are trying to engage in predicting or figuring out who's going to attack and stop them before it happens. Much harder thing to do. And so there has to be a certain amount of secrecy to how you do that. Because if it's revealed how you do it, the other side can take countermeasures to stop it. So uh, to give one example, which is, was in the 9-11 Commission report, so it's public now, um, during the trial of the, and, and this causes tension with our criminal justice system because our trials are open and public. And one of the great features of the Bill of Rights is that the government has to put into the public record all the evidence it has about you. Unfortunately, that can cause problems for the other approach of trying to stop an attack before they happen. So uh, in 1993, during the trial of the first 1993 World Trade Center bombing, um, the government, uh, one, gave to the defense a list of all the people we thought had conspired 
to blow up the World Trade Center. It's a list of about 190 names. That actually was a list of everyone thought was a member of Al-Qaeda at the time. And that list was turned over sooner or later to Al-Qaeda itself. It was found actually in Al-Qaeda's safe house years later. But think about what a great intelligence boon that was to Al-Qaeda to have a list of who we thought their members were. And then outside the courtroom, for some reason, the government leaked that we had the ability to intercept uh, the personal phone calls that Osama bin Laden was making on his cell phone. I think because we wanted to show that we could prove that bin Laden had actually made the order to blow up the trade center. And uh, within 48 hours, he stopped using that phone. And as far as we know, he never used another cell phone ever again. You know, again, think about how, what an intelligence advantage it was to be able to. It was thought at that time to be technologically impossible, actually, to eavesdrop on a particular cell phone um, using certain kinds of encryption. So the tension is, you know, how do we maintain our commitment to a certain level of openness and transparency while protecting the secrets that we need to to fight the war while it's ongoing. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm not sure what the right answer is going to be every time. The, the situation you mentioned really does raise that to the fore. How much ability should the government have to data mine large collections of innocent uh, transactions and movements and uh, activities to try to find patterns that somebody is actually up to doing something? Um, you know, none of this has ever come up in court as far as I know. I mean, the, uh, I think at some level the government has to do some of that. I mean, when you try to buy a one-way ticket to cash at the airport and you're being put under special security scrutiny, that's essentially what the government is doing, is saying there are certain things that seem to be a tag to somebody perhaps having some kind of hostile intent. Um, but it sweeps in innocent civilian activity too. Um, my hope is that uh, the United States, one of our great things is uh, technological innovation and advancements in computer technology. My, my personal approach would be to allow computers to do most of this, but only to allow a human being to get involved if there were a certain level of dangerousness reached by you know, a high level of correlation between someone and the, the markers they're looking for for terrorist activity because my hope, the, the, the real harm to privacy is if people know about right, the regular private activities of another citizen. Maybe if computers could do it instead and then only involve a human being at, you know, when something serious is afoot, maybe that could do the job. Uh, now, I will say that the, um, you know, the Obama administration just announced that they were going to um, go pretty far in the direction of this data mining. I think they announced that they're, that they're going to keep uh, these kinds of transactional records for five year periods so that they could be continuously searched. Whereas I think ever since 9-11, the rule was something like 30 to 90 days. It wasn't five years where this information was gonna be collected. Um, so I certainly think that, uh, I wanna say, that, uh, so the, the abilities that one could get through data mining give the United States an advantage in this war. But I do agree we have to figure out a way to do it that's consistent with protecting privacy. And maybe my easy way out is the use of computers that actually made the end be impractical and doesn't work. Um, and then I think we're gonna have to figure out a different solution. Other solutions I think that people have come up with I don't think really address the issue. Like a, a judge has to issue a warrant first. Um, I don't know if that really does a good job of um, addressing this concern that you have. I really think that uh, technology is going to be the one that has to put in the right barrier. Sorry for the long-winded answer. You asked a deliberately com complex question. Now. <laughs> Somebody. Uh, oh, oh, sure. uh, yes, I have a question. I've read that some of the people, some of the prisoners in Guantanamo are there because they were denounced by neighbors in Afghanistan mm -hmm. that had a grudge against them. There is no evidence that so they were members of Al-Qaeda. Mm. Uh, we haven't got habeas corpus here. What do those people do? What can we do to help them? Well, um, first is they all actually have a right to habeas corpus. Um, every, um, actually, I believe every detainee at Guantanamo Bay actually has a pending habeas corpus case in federal court somewhere right now um, in the Washington, D.C. District Court. Uh, this is one of the first things that happened right after 9-11. 
uh, Guantanamo Bay. They also have, they also all have cases going in military court too, challenging their detention. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to say, I don't want to be right to say that there were no mistakes made in the people who were detained, that um, there are accounts of people who were turned in by neighbors or were um, journalists or Red Cross, you know, people captured by mistake. Um, and uh, military should not and does not want to be in the business of holding, wasting resources and time holding people who are not threats to the country. I mean, everybody has an interest in uh, reducing those errors and correcting for them. Now, um, I'm not in the government anymore, so I don't know what the files are on all those folks, but the uh, Obama administration, when it came into office, undertook a uh, multi-year review of all the individuals at Guantanamo Bay, and their conclusion was that none of them should be released, that all the people who should be released had been released. Uh, you know, the Bush administration released hundreds upon hundreds of people um, in two th you know, from 2003 to 2006, I believe. Um, I don't, I mean, I, all I can say is this, you now have another set of eyes that have looked at those same files and you have, from a different political party after several elections and their view was that uh, at this point all the people of Guantanamo Bay should be continue to be held. But I don't know personally, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't have the you know, right to look at those files and learn. And, they, and then and a federal judge in Washington, D.C. is going through all those files too. That doesn't mean that there won't be any errors, just like I'd be the first to admit our criminal justice system makes mistakes too. And we have had people who have been convicted and tried and convicted and are serving sentences, have served sentences in jail who are innocent. And so the, the difficulty is how do you create a system to reduce that as much as humanly possible? Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering if I get your input on uh, the policy regarding uh, UNESCO and the U.S. Uh, withdrawal of funds from any organization that recognizes the PLO as a state and how that affects U.S. foreign policy. Uh, for example, UNESCO doing programs in Afghanistan that has a positive effect for the U.S. military. Yeah, I, I have to say, I have to confess I am not as up as I should be probably on um, the Israeli-Palestine conflict, Palestinian conflict, and this particular issue. I know it happened. Uh, that uh, I believe it was a congressional shutoff. Actually, I think it was a, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was a congressional cutoff, not just a, an executive branch one. But I think, isn't it correct, Congress passed a statute requiring it and the Obama administration just had to carry it out. And so actually, and there's also, interestingly, there was just a Supreme Court case in, that raises the same kind of issue about the conflict between the executive branch and Congress with the uh, listing of birthplaces on passports that was just released this week about um, American Jew who wanted to have their passport say they were born in Jerusalem, Israel, as, were, as is allowed by congressional statute, but the president and the executive branch doesn't want to have people putting that in their passport because it undermines our diplomacy. So, uh, you know, again, I think, again, but I think that these are areas where Congress is allowed to act through the power of the purse or um, I think control of what a passport is. I think the president is still the one in charge of conducting diplomacy and foreign affairs for the country. And uh, Congress has ways to frustrate that, as it is doing, as you mentioned, with a uh, cutoff of funding for UN agencies. They've done it before. Uh, when Jesse Helms was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations, I mean, he would enjoy cutting off all funds to the UN uh, for years on end. So it is, a, I mean, I don't, I think it, it shows you the defects of this kind of constitutional setup and that you can have instability in American policy and you can have American policy doing contradictory things. Um, however, I think that is the way the framers thought that the foreign policy would get made, that the president um, is the one who's in charge with communicating with other countries and setting a policy. It's something we've had since George Washington on, but that Congress doesn't have to pay for anything it disagrees with and that Congress wants to use its funding power to try to frustrate the president, they can do it. It's un, it may be unwise, but I think constitutionally they, they can and they have many times in the past. I think we're gonna take just two more questions. We've got one here. 
Professor Yu, welcome to Lawrence. I've got a couple of questions for you concerning harsh interrogation uh, yeah, and the, <laughs> the outcome it of it. Uh, great. A couple of the benefits claimed for it are you get better information and you get the information much more rapidly. A concern that has often been expressed for it is that if the United States engages in harsh interrogation, when its own people, often its, its own combatants, are captured, they may be subjected to the same form of interrogation, and that would be a bad thing. Uh, we're now, obviously, more than 10 years beyond 9-11. Uh, As you have considered and studied uh, these issues, do you have an opinion on whether the claim benefits of harsh interrogation have actually been realized? And do you have an opinion on whether, based upon the experience of our diplomats, citizens, and armed forces abroad, there has actually been, let's call it harm, to the United States because its people have been subjected to harsh interrogation? I, I, first of all, I think it's a great question, and I think that's the kind of um, analysis we should pursue when it comes time to making this policy and deciding whether to follow it. And I'll tell you that when we were um, uh, deciding on interrogation policy, those were some of the very factors that people were, ar were arguing about, which is are we actually going to um, get reliable information that actually is something that can be acted upon and is of a benefit um, that cannot be acquired any other way? What about the effects on our own troops? Uh, uh, what, uh, what, will, what would this do? in terms of a precedent for how our troops are treated in a future war, or by, or in the current war. Um, and I can just tell you what, how people, you know, people we elected and appointed to office, how they thought this out at the time, um, is that, uh, again, in those years, right after, months and years after 9-11, it was uh, maybe shocking or surprising how little intelligence we had on Al-Qaeda, and that this really was, uh, for good or ill, we had to rely on this source as the primary source of intelligence that we had. And it was so for many years after 9-11, well after I left the government. You still have CIA directors who are testifying to Congress about how the interrogations have produced the great majority of intelligence we had that could be acted upon. I certainly also don't deny the costs uh, that you mentioned. Um, the question is how great they are. Um, one thing that we in the government had thought about at, after 9-11 was that um, Al-Qaeda in particular in this war was going to do terrible things to our soldiers no matter what. Um, they did not take prisoners. Um, and maybe uh, this is a product of what was happening at that time, but uh, and we saw what happened to Wall Street Journal reporter Danny Pearl. Um, there were reports in Afghanistan that um, soldiers who were cut off from their units were shot on site by Al Qaeda. They were not, no one was, there were no prisoners taken uh, by Al Qaeda. This was not an enemy that was going to follow any kind of Geneva Convention or anything similar. And so, one, uh, and maybe this was the wrong decision, but I think uh, the intelligence coming in was that nothing we could do was going to affect how Al Qaeda was going to, or was going to encourage them to treat our soldiers or citizens better than they were going to. Unfortunately, I think, in fact, they, one of their tactics was to right, do things like what happened to Danny Pearl. Now, it's a good question to say 10 years later, uh, one might make that balance, cut that balance differently. Um, we obviously have much more intelligence on Al Qaeda than we did before. And so the need for intelligence from those interrogations might be less because we're getting them in other ways. Um, I, I just I don't know whether that's true uh, at this point, having been out of the government. Um, I'd be surprised if it were because um, you know Al Qaeda, because of the way they operate and they're organized, it's very hard for us to get intelligence on them. I and mean, we don't have we don't have informants. I mean, I think it's pretty wide. We don't have informants in the higher circles circles of Al Qaeda. Um, they're not using the telephone for us to intercept. Um, so it's harder to get intelligence on them the way we would on a normal opponent. Um, in terms of the harms, uh, 
I, I think the, the harm I would worry most about is not now how al-Qaeda would treat us, but say we had a war with another country, say, I mean, like China or somebody, would they treat our soldiers and citizens worse than they normally would have because of what happened in our policy and our war against al-Qaeda? That I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I tend not to think that how we acted to al-Qaeda is going to change how uh, some enemy in the future, like a China or a Russia or somebody, is going to act with regard to our soldiers. Um, unfortunately, I also will say that in pretty much every war since 1945 the United States has fought, the enemy has not followed the Geneva Conventions, even when they've signed them, no matter what we did. I mean, that's something that uh, fa I factor into that calculus. But I, I will tell you, I, I I hope I've described how we thought about it in the Bush administration, but I also want to make sure, uh, sure you understand that I don't think, I'm not claiming that that was utterly correct and right, and I can prove to you with 100% certainty that was the right call to make, uh, and certainly not that that would be the right decision now. I can just tell you what, we, what decision we could make on the information we had at the time, and I do think that it contributed to the ability to prevent terrorist attacks these last 10 years, and to eventually f locate and kill Bin Laden and his top lieutenants. I, I don't think without that intelligence that those would have been possible, that those successes would have been possible. It might have been a too high a cost though, as you say. I don't think so, but others might disagree. Bill, do we have one more out here or are we? Okay. Last one and then we will, he has several different books on sale out by the front door and I think we'll, after this one break up, if anybody wants to purchase a book, I know Professor, you'd be happy to sign. He'll also be happy to chat with folks after the event is concluded, so. Although my signing might reduce the resale value. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Um, I, I disagree with your characterization of your work um, on defining torture as simply an objective analysis of, of what's out there and clarifying guidelines. And when you're, when you're talking about um, comparing um, the viewpoint in Britain and Europe, when when the the things that you produced went pushed boundaries far beyond anything that would appear there, do you really claim that your efforts in that area were simply clarifying existing principles and laws? And then more importantly, why do we even need to create this third area that's somewhere between traditional war? And, and criminal justice to, to deal with terrorism, instead of, instead of creating this entire new area, why don't we just redefine war and redefine the possible opponents to include a group like Al-Qaeda that has declared war on the United States and, and apply the laws of war, and then you, you have two options, instead of having these three, including this muddled muddled thing that you're trying to create, you have two options of choosing whether you deal with an act, act as criminal or an act by um, an, an uh, enemy. Well, let me, let me And uh, it, would, it would take away some freedom in your ability to act, but it would give you a great benefit in, in, in terms of being able to have two areas with clearly defined principles that the world recognizes and admires America's principles in those areas. Well, and let me, uh, so first, let me answer your first question. First, I do believe that we were engaged in an effort to interpret a statute passed by Congress, which had never been interpreted by any court in the United States before, and had never been interpreted by the Justice Department before, never been applied before. And so I think we really were trying to figure out what Congress was trying to do in that statute so as to make it clear to people who had to set policy what it is they could do that was legal and what was illegal. Because I think what's unfair to the people who actually have to do the much harder job of fighting these wars, I think it's unfair to let them have to operate under any kind of uncertainty about what they their liability is going to be and what the rules are because I think then you make it difficult for them to do their jobs and we subject them to all kinds of negative consequences after. And so you could disagree where we drew the line, but I, 
I firmly believe that we had to draw a clear line. There are some people who think that we shouldn't have and that uh, you know, the legal work should not have been so, uh, maybe try to make, become so absolute and try to really define it in the way we did. But I really thought that was an obligation that we had. You sound, it sounds like you disagree where we drew the line and certainly as I, I've often thought that reasonable people can differ on what the right line is about uh, the statute. But I don't think that it's uh, good for mayor policy or good as a role of a lawyer or good for the country that we not sit down and do that beforehand, before we figure out what the policy is. Um, the second thing about your question about why not just either choose the laws of war, or laws of crime as they've been defined and put into practice before, uh, to me the theory is a, the, the, the laws of war did not, well first of all, the criminal justice system had failed. I mean, the criminal justice system had not given the country enough tools to defeat Al-Qaeda. Uh, the September 11th attacks succeed in part because uh, the United States had limited itself to the criminal justice system. Um, this is not a partisan issue or anything. This is something all, all the previous administrations had done. But I don't think it would fit perfectly into the laws of war because the enemy was not a nation. And so the United States had to do some thinking about how do the laws of war adapt to the situation when the opponent is not a country but is in fact uh, a group of individuals who have sometimes the power of violence in their hands that only used to lie in the hands of nations but don't have a territory or population, does not sign treaties, does not follow any of the, follow any of the rules of war themselves. And so to me, it, you can't say that it, you have that choice because the circumstances don't fit into either one um, as cleanly as you might think. And so I think that's what we did in the years after 9 and we're continuing to do as a country is trying to figure out how the rules of war should adapt to this new circumstance of this opponent that doesn't have a country behind it. All right, well I think on that note we should close and thank Professor Yu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.